There is but one question I think we must ask ourselves in 2024, and that is how will we as parents, caregivers, communities help create a safer digital space for the kids and for families alike? You know, the question can be answered by one of the biggest digital safety warriors that I no, his name is Chris McKenna, founder of Protect Young Eyes. He leads Protect Young Eyes and is a social media expert. He's a dad. He's an advocate. He works with Congress. He works on policy. Uh, he's showing kids, parents, churches, communities how to be safe with tech at home, schools, everywhere there is. Chris is there. Uh, you know, he describes himself as a man with, or somebody describes you, Chris, as a man with never ending energy. And I'm going to attest to that. Because Chris is truly uh, one of the few people I can say is infectious in this whole movement of protection that empowers me as a warrior to spread the information, to, to be uplifted on a daily basis, to continue down this path, which is not easy. But enough of my talk, because I know all of you, we want to hear from uh, Chris directly. The website, protectyoungeyes.com. Write that down. Put it in your phone. Memorize it. Whatever you do, protectyoungeyes.com. One-stop shopping enough. Welcome Chris McKenna to the Warriors. Thank you, Lynn. Always a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Well, I'm just so thankful you're taking the time because I know how busy you are. Uh, let's start with 2024. What keeps you up at night? I just had a conversation about what keeps me up at night, speaking with a school who is over that is overrun in their counseling department with young people who are being overrun at home with explicit content. And they are so troubled, they don't know how to handle it, what to do during the seven hours that they that they control. Pornography has been something that's kept me up. It was something that ruined my life for years. And now what we have is a scalable, AI-driven, deep fake-driven version of this that is out of control, Lynn. I don't know how else to describe it. It is, it is out of control already. Porn has always disproportionately harmed women and children, and that is now at a massive scale multiplied. Um, I just read an article yesterday that states that over 100,000 images, deep fake images, are being added to the internet every single day, and 99% are of women because that's what the models are being trained on. So I, I'm kept up by the access that our young people have good kids that have access to all kinds of technologies that were never designed with them in mind. That has always been my, we'll call it heartburn <laughs> that I have for, for protecting children. And that is we, we perpetually just roll things out without any consideration for the young humans that will use them. We don't design with them in mind. And that started keeping me up eight years ago and that still keeps me up today, but now at a scale that is difficult to, to fathom. We must move quickly. Um, Chris, that is what <laughs> keeps me up at night. It's a, a little bit, you know, it's AI, AGI, and then reading, I'm in New York City and reading local stories uh, recently mm -hmm. in New Jersey uh, where uh, high school girls uh, went right. to school and that whole story and they were being laughed at, pointed at. It took four days, according to what we read, we were told to take these images down, Mm -hmm. But you know what really got me, Chris, is the principal, a woman, her response was, her response was, well, we took the images down. So the, the key about raising awareness and education, that is not good enough because we know once these images are out there, even if they're taken down, they have been shared. They are all over. So that's the type of thing. The kids are exposed to it. The adults don't really know about it. And we have to constantly, I don't know if this is a good word, Chris, but like brainwash, like you know, you brush your teeth, you eat, you sleep every day, you go to school, work. You got to be on top of your digital safety. I wanted you to explain the landscape a little bit also. You sort of just did. And I know this is a loaded question. What would your, uh, if you're, if you're, you know, talking right now to somebody who never heard any of this and they're like, who are these people, this Lynn's Warriors and this Chris McKenna, mm -hmm. how, how would you give it like an elevator pitch of the landscape online today, the internet for kids? Well, there's no such thing as a child who isn't prepared for this world, who doesn't have access to it. So the first thing that I would say is that all of the messaging and all of the marketing that is trying to convince us that children need technology 
is all wrong. <laughs> it, it, it truly is. And so first I would tell parents to listen to your heart, right? Before you put a child, see, I tend to, this is important for people to understand because of the, the things that I'm about to say. I see the world through a lens of risk, risk balance. And that comes from 12 years out at Ernst & Young Consulting. I worked with businesses to manage business financial reporting risk. And what I recognized by doing that job for years, Lynn, is you can't get rid of all risk, both professional or personal. You can't get rid of all of it, nor would I want to. I don't want my children to have a perfectly bubble wrap protected childhood because that turns them into adults who don't know how to deal with the difficulties of the world, right? I get that. But at the same time, there are places that are available to our children now that I think create a disproportionate amount of risk in their life. And many of those places are digital. And so I just, I want us as parents and as grandparents and caregivers just to step back for just a minute and, and just ask ourselves, are any digital spaces, particularly for our youngest children, absolutely necessary for them to achieve the best version of their childhood? And I think that's a really important question. People ask me all the time, Lynn, well, what's the right age to give my kids access to a smartphone or give my kids access to social media? And I think that's the wrong question. Instead, I want us to ask a bigger question, and that is what digital decisions give my child the best chance at the best childhood? Because I could say age 14 or 16 for certain digital spaces, but that's not true for all children. There are some 16-year-olds. Heck, there are some 36-year-olds who mentally, psychologically right cannot handle the pressure and the algorithmic recommendations and all the things that come at us, right? And so I as parents, we just, we have to ask bigger, deeper questions. So that's what I would say to a family today is to critically challenge. And this isn't just some, you know, religious conservative boomer sort of perspective. <laughs> I was just with a large group of global experts, doctors and scientists and psychologists all over the world, over in Europe a few weeks ago. I'd spoken about this online, you know, I was at the World Economic Forum and this is an issue that is being felt globally. And I spoke to a, a scientist, the head scientist from the American Psychological Association. And he shared with me, you know, very, very candidly, I'm going to pull up the quote here to, to make sure that I, I get it right, that essentially that evidence, right, is starting to show us that all children are their best when they're not in digital spaces right? That there's no evidence that says that a child is maladapted to this world in any way, that they're going to do worse in college or get a worse job because they don't have early access to digital spaces. And then he went on to say that some of the children who are best shaped for relationships, who are adapting the best to this world are those who are delayed in what they get. So this is why you hear me say all the time, delay is the way. It's not just some guy who doesn't like technology, you know that I love it. It's just that I believe the very best thing for children in 2016 and in 2024, it's still the same. And it's most often things that are analog. Oh, you, I have so many questions for you, Chris, and I'm going to jump around. Um, let's just go back for a minute to the World Economic Forum. That was one of my questions. I thought that was, first of all, let's point out, None of the work you do, I do, any of us do in this space, it is a bipartisan issue. It doesn't belong to any political party. It is about the safety for children, families overall. We live in a digital world. It's not going away. You just said you don't want, you love it. I love it. It's the way it is. So let us, I think this is your quote I'm stealing, let us leverage the internet for good. I think I heard you say that along the way and I kind of stole it and adapted it. I fully admit when I steal. Okay, Chris. So I, um, um, I give you credit. Um, you know, and this is not about religion. It's not about anything. This is about safety, safety. So when I heard you were going to the World Economic Forum, I thought that was terrific. I thought, you know, I've got to ask Chris about this because yeah. the more we talk about it, the more it's on a global scale. So what else can you share about that experience uh, that happened while you were there? The takeaway, were there any, uh, they're going to step up globally anyway? Like what, what happened there? Well, we went in exact opposition to many of the things and messages that were going on there, right? As you walked up and down in Davos there, the, the promenade, everything was AI, AI house, every business, whether it was, you know, Deloitte or Salesforce or whoever it was, right? As they have all their locations, right? Where they're having meetings all during the week, everything was about AI. 
I was there with a group of experts that throughout the week, we were under the umbrella called the human change movement. In other words, we're seeing changes in humans because of these issues. Let's have critical conversations about it. So we had 12 different 60 minute roundtable conversations with experts. Some are, I was on panels, others I facilitated panels about technology in schools, technology impact on mental well being, and what we can do to create more conversation at all different levels, right? At the parent level, at the government level, at the global level. Um, at the school level, right? At the manufacturer level, how can we create more conversations around these issues? So it was fascinating. As people came in to the building that we were at, we were having these meetings all week long. It was unbelievable to talk to them. First, the first thing they said was, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the, the, the issues we run up against is that many of the you know, decision makers, individuals with resources, they're not aware of the things that those of us in the trenches, parents and grandparents that are dealing with these issues on these devices every single day, the ubiquity of technology, they're simply not aware. And so we heard that over and over again. So that was what we did there was we tried to wake up this understanding as to the realities mm -hmm. that are going on in all these digital spaces. Just to give the listeners here, the, the viewers, an idea of opposing forces that existed at this event, right? So I just explained all that we stood for as a part of trying to raise awareness around the changes that are happening at, you know, in young people and adults, right? The dehumanization that is taking place by us being stuck in digital spaces. I had a conversation with a young man, a young entrepreneur, uh, probably in his mid thirties. He had bought and sold different businesses. It was on Thursday of being there. Um, and I was talking to this young man, his first name was Logan. And he had said to me um, that early on, he had really long hair. This will make sense in just a minute. And he had donated his hair to Locks of Love. And he thought that was a really cool thing to do as a young child. And he said to me in all seriousness, Lynn, he said to me, wouldn't it be great if we could get a whole army of young people to grow out their hair, cut it off and donate it so we could put it on robots to make them more lifelike? That was his idea of progress, of a better version of humanity. He was genuinely excited about this as a possibility. All the while, I'm terrified having this conversation with him, imagining that as a better version of us, right? So that's just one micro example of the kinds of opposing voices that are out there that we have to speak loudly if we want the world to understand what's really going on. I almost have no response and I'm never at a loss for words, but I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll let that go. But, you, but you know what, Chris, they grow up. I like to say, you know, like maybe 30 and under, they have grown up in this digital bubble and you pointed out everything there at the world economic forum, AI, AI, AI. It's again, that word like brainwashing. Right. Um, I think it, it was excellent. Don't you agree that you were there and talking to people? At least they, at least they opened it up. But I have to I have to be honest with you. Do you think it was just kind of a pat on the back so we can they can say like uh, you can answer this any way you want or not answer it like okay so you know we're addressing some of these opposition you know uh, thoughts feelings people or do you think they're genuinely I I don't know you know interested in let's have everybody at the table to talk about all of this in this unknown world we are in we're not entering AI and AGI like we're here already. That is a great question. And like you often don't, you know, have run out of words to say, I don't know, Lynn, I, I truly don't know. I'm only about six weeks past. There's a lot of conversations that are still going on with the coalition that I was there with. We're trying to create, you know, a, a larger coalition of influencers and uh, not what though not the way we typically think about, but those who have influenced, right, researchers and others to try to create more movement here. Um, we tend to think that most of the most effective change here is going to happen from the grassroots, the ground up. Mm -hmm. Many of the individuals listening to this, right? You think back to the mad days, mothers against drunk driving. In fact, I just received an article today that was speaking about mama, the mothers against media addiction group that kind of organically started out of Tristan Harris's center for humane mm -hmm. technology that is now growing in prominence, right? actually led by a mom who's a former Google ethicist who, 
uh, seeing this, you know, going on. So I think we need pressure from both sides of this. Um, I have more faith that ordinary, amazing individuals from the ground up will be able to move more nimbly and with more effectiveness than I do in the top down. Not that we're going to stop the top down, but we've seen the ineptitude of our federal government to make any meaningful change. We're seeing a little more nimbleness at the state level, but I want to mobilize more parents and uh, you know more professionals and teachers to move upward to say we are fed up and we're going to do something about this. And I think that's maybe a better chance for change. I mean, I, I see this, this is my opinion, Chris, that's where the change can happen, you know, where there's no really red tape at that community level in the home, right. the community, and let it snowball from there. At least at the Warriors, we work that way because that's where we, right. you know, we, we have the thinking instead of shutting down because people report this, they probably tell you all the time, Chris, they're so overwhelmed. They can't. And I get a lot of grandparents and they're like, we can't, yeah. we don't know what to do. We're overwhelmed. My son or daughter doesn't listen about my granddaughter, or grandson. I don't want anybody to close that door, shut their eyes, shut the door. We want to be able to make it easy and just give them a couple of easy tools, you know, just something easy to start with. That is my biggest fear. You know, uh, um, they just shut down because it's easier to do than talk about all of this. Um, but we're not allowing that on our watch, are we? No um, well, I'm, I'm still going to say I, ha I have hope. I have hope. That is where the pressure, getting the coalitions together, getting more parents involved, getting the teachers involved. Uh, That's right. You know, and getting groups just in the community involved and definitely places of worship. They have to get involved. All of us together can. You know, our goal is one person a day, one child, one person, one discussion like we're having right now. Everybody can do one thing a day. That's what we do. So let me ask you, let me, let me now switch over to, so you're a dad and how do you handle all of this? Um, I mean, the kids see you working on this. They hear you talking. They, um, they see you traveling because I don't know. I saw your itinerary. You've got 500 million churches and schools and organizations you're going to. I do not exaggerate to anybody <laughs> listening. <laughs> and we're going to have all your information in the body of this video. Um, what, what happens with them? Do they ever ask questions or do you, do you and your wife have to facilitate it? Or is it just yeah. like in them because they hear you all the time? What goes on in your household you want to share? Yeah. 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 I think a little bit of all of that. So for those watching, um, I have a daughter who is in college, a uh, freshman in college, and then I have three middle school boys. So pray for us as we come to mind. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a sixth, seventh and an eighth grader. Um, I have a set of twins in there who are in different grades in seventh and eighth. I have a son with Down syndrome. So I've got all kinds of different fun things going on uh, among four children and they are immersed in it. I am unapologetic about including them in my conversations, listening in. If you could see the rest of my office here, I intentionally have a couch in my office. I intentionally have a stand with all of our devices that's here in my office. They have to come in here. They have to listen sometimes to what I'm saying. They have to sit on the couch and play the switch or search whatever they want to on the Chromebook here while I'm on Zoom calls. I truly want them immersed in the words, the culture, the phrases that are important to Andrea and I in our home. And that's a word that I want everybody to think about. It's not just control. I actually can't stand the phrase parental controls. I mean, you think about the 14 or 15 year old version of you, Lynn, or myself, and imagine your parents coming to you and saying, I've got something great for your teenage years. Do you know what it's called? It's called parental controls. All right. right? horrible, right? No teen wants that. You wouldn't have wanted it either. So I guess that's the first thing as parents to remember empathy, empathy. You wouldn't have wanted these kinds of things either. Okay. So the 14 year old version of you would have reacted just the same. But where I was going with that is yes, we need some control, but it really is important to have a family culture around this and look for opportunities through words and through yeah. actions to communicate that culture. A real tangible example of that some who follow us on social media will remember this video that I showed. My 14-year-old son, Cole, had friends over to spend the night two weeks ago on Friday. One of his friends brought over an Xbox. An Xbox not only plays games, but it connects to the internet so they can get into their online Microsoft accounts and download other games. Cole, of course, knows our Wi-Fi password. So when his friend wanted to connect his Xbox to our router, Cole gave him our Wi-Fi password. 
we have a Griffin router, which allows me to identify everything that's attached to our home network. My network did not recognize this new device. So I got a notification on my phone telling me that new device, do you want to let it in? I said, yes, I have a kid's profile for all friends who come to our house that I attached it to that profile that has certain filtering attached to it. That's the control part. Then I got to walk downstairs and say, hey, fellas, here's what just happened. Thank you for attaching to our Wi-Fi. I got a notification. I let you in. It's now being filtered. I can see what's going on. If you guys tonight while playing games, I, I want you to have fun. But if anything happens that bothers you, that's weird, that you just go, whoa, come and tell me. It's no big deal. Have fun. And then I walked back upstairs. That's the culture part of it. That's letting them know that I'm safe. It's letting them know I'm involved. One of the most effective deterrents of bad behavior is simply the knowledge that another human is involved in what you're doing online. Accountability does that. It's what saved me from pornography. Accountability through a service like Covenant Eyes because other humans were now involved in my life and that involvement, that relationship, that connection is what draws us into a more honorable way of living. And that's just something I think that gets overlooked. We want to set the toggle. We want to set the switch. We want to subscribe to the software, but there's no such thing as set it and forget it in the digital age. You've got to dive into that relational side. And I actually think that's more effective yes. than any parental control that you could ever buy. Absolutely. No isolation. That's the way I look at it. You know, more talking about it, more openness and honesty with the kids. The kids are so smart. I don't have to tell you, Chris, all kids today, that um, we have to kind of get on their level and just relate. What do they, as you travel the country and you speak about digital safety and all the issues surrounding all of this, what do the kids relay to you? Uh, what, what do they say? What are they looking for? What are they feeling? What do they think is wrong? Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, one of the phrases that I've enjoyed using recently, um, especially with the middle schoolers. So just last week, I was um, at a school over in, in Utah and spoke to grade six through eight. And there was a study that came out that said that in just the year 2023, Lynn, $11 billion was made in advertising yes. by apps like YouTube and others on children, right? So I put this big number up on the screen. This is 11 billion. And I say, did any of you get a check from YouTube for Christmas, thanking you for your time and attention last year? Like, no. Did any of you pay when you downloaded Snapchat or Instagram or TikTok? Like, no, it was free. I said, well, that means you're the product, number one. And that means all of you are unpaid child labor. How does that make you feel? And they just sort of sit there for a minute and they're like, I, I, I could see very vividly one boy that was sitting off to my right and he just went, Poof, like that was the action he made while, while sitting there. And- Good. I think those are moments where you're just informing them of what is actually going on. And then they get a little indignant. They're like, well, that's not right. Yeah, you're, you're right. That's not right. And so as we say to them, if we don't decide intentionally how to use our technology, then it will decide how to use us. And I think kids just really appreciate that empowerment, that knowledge right. of I didn't know. And so that's what I'm hearing. And my parent talk, Lynn, the night before, I had two high schoolers who attended that talk and they were intrigued by the brain science. And I think that's a really effective teaching for high schoolers to understand why they think the way they do when they get into certain digital spaces. Because when you understand as a young person that that front part of your brain isn't what is activated by Snapchat. It's actually that middle emotional part of your brain, that dopamine loop that it leverages and sometimes weaponizes. There's a, a mind, there's an awareness there to go, wait a minute. I know why now it's so easy for me to get caught up in notifications and I can make a change, right? So when they understand how they think and how they're wired, how they're created, I think it just gives them more tools for them to have more agency and how they use technology well. So those are two things that happened just last Thursday and Friday that I think are just exemplary, you know, examples of what kids are looking for. They need to know these just, you know, this information they, and, and then they can make some decisions for themselves. It's awesome. I think it's so, <laughs> if you just tell kids, you're the product, they're making money off of you and you're not getting paid. That's it. I think that's right. That's what kids could could relate to. What do you mean we're the product? We're not making money. What um I mean, excellent. What you just outlined and also for parents is exactly what is needed. Now, now, Chris, 
I have a little bit of, of a bone to pick. This is me. Add, add an answer as you'd like to see fit. Our 118th Congress. Now, we're ever so slightly getting, getting a little closer to having Kids Online Safety Act perhaps yeah. brought to the floor for a vote. Um, they're a little slow on everything, but I, again, am feeling very hopeful that uh, this, this is perhaps going someplace. What can you share with us about all of this? Right. We have something we haven't had in 25 years, which kind of should blow all of our minds a little bit. And that is the possibility that a bill that would protect children better online could go to a vote in the Senate. We're not there yet even, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, right, we have 64, I think now, co-sponsors. 64 kind of, last time I heard, yeah. Yep, yeah, which is unbelievable that we still can't get a, a vote on this thing. So I hope that happens. This bill would be monumental. It would force really good things to happen in the name of updating what are egregiously out of date federal laws. Nothing really since COPPA in 1998, which inadvertently made all of us believe that children are digital adults at age 13. That was never its intent, but that's what's happened here. So I am hopeful. Um, we've got to get through noise here related to the election and other things, but I'm hopeful that we will finally see something that will get voted out of the Senate. Now, what happens in the House is a whole nother ball of wax. That That's where I believe activating warriors like you're in touch with and others, we have truly, we, we need the will of the people to be heard on this. Um, and that is marching, that is going, that is meeting. I think, and, and you know this, I think we, the, you know, in general, individuals and parents that I talk to underestimate their ability to just go show up and have meetings with our legislators. They don't, like, they don't understand they can do it. <laughs> anybody right now that's watching this, you could hop on a plane to DC tomorrow and you could walk to your Senator or representative's office. And if there's a chief of staff or somebody there, they'll meet with you. Like you can literally have those conversations as you walk around DC. And those are the kinds of things I just want to rise up, uh, you know, a whole, army of warriors to go and to have these kinds of conversations to, again, to make it happen. But also, Chris, we can empower people to, people say, I can't make it to Washington at, you know, know who represents you, you know, house.gov, senate.gov, right. go on the local level, encourage, call, email. Uh, if you're so inclined, write a letter and put a stamp on it. Just deluge them with this That's and they right. have to address it because we have to urge everybody that boots on the ground. You have to, you can get involved. You have to get involved. And I, for one, must selfishly say with Chuck Schumer that I harassed very appropriately. Mm. Finally, th this is why it gives me hope, you know, finally made a little movement on the New York end. Um, but again, we need you warriors out there. Again, That's I'll right. have all this information for everybody in the body of the video. We have to keep up the pressure. We have to keep on this and we can't let it go. The job is not done yet. Now, let me ask you, what are some, uh, give us some recommendations for, what do you think, what are good apps or platforms you think kids should be on? Or um, do you have any recommendations or you don't like to actually do that because there's yeah, so there? You know, what are the, the sure. safe, the safe things sort of safe? Right. So what the, the approach we tend to take, Lynn, and you know this, you've been such an amazing advocate, which oh, I just want to thank, thank, thank publicly for the, oh, the support. Thank you, we, going back to the risk, right? Every home and every child is different. There's different variables, different life experience, different parenting styles. We present a ridiculous amount of information so that parents can make a balanced decision. There are some 15-year-olds who might be able to handle the TikTok algorithm. There are some 18 year olds who maybe can't. So the overall thing that I would say is for parents to do your research and then use whatever you're going to allow your children to use for seven straight days as a child would use it before they would. That's our seven day rule. Go make a child's account, go interact at the age of that account of what child is going to be to see what is in say the discover section of Snapchat or what's recommended for followers or accounts to follow on Instagram or TikTok. Live in it, immerse yourself in it so that you can understand because they, you know your child best what they can and can't handle. I challenge teachers when I do PD sessions, I'll do half and full day retreats with schools and districts and dioceses. 
and I'll ask, okay, who are the junior and senior high teachers? And you know, they'll all raise their hand. And I'll say, keep your hand up if you have on your phone right now any one of Snapchat, Instagram, or TikTok. And most of the hands go down. And then I call them out a little bit and say, I think that's part of the problem. I want you to download it and use it. You don't need to go home and make dorky videos, but I want you to download it and use it to be a part of it so you have some understanding as to why they respond and use these apps the way that they do. And that's the same exact thing that I want parents to do. Different children respond differently to the algorithm in TikTok. Different kids respond differently to that dopamine loop that gets activated so readily through constant notifications and Snapchat. Some kids just can't handle it. Right, certain kids can and can't handle seeing a millisecond of perfectly polished perfection on Instagram from their peers. These are things that each parent has to weigh based on their knowledge of their child to make that risk based decision for their childhood. Protectyoungeyes.com is the website, Chris. You know, you have some wonderful blogs. I'm always saying, you know, if you don't know how to use the uh, whatever, if it's an Apple iPhone. With all those steps, you know, go to protectyoungeyes.com. The information is there. It's laid out. Chris, you can email Chris. You can find out what the team is doing. You're available to go across the country, talk about all of these issues. Um, I mean, I can't thank you enough. I, I know I'm always gushing with you, Chris, but I can't help myself. This is the way I feel. I want to, you know, time is always of the essence, but, um, and we'll be continuing as we go along. What do you want to leave people with listening? If you had one final thought, kind of a loaded question, what do you want them to know, leave them with? We just don't want them to close their eyes or walk away, close that door. We want to keep at this. We need warriors. We need community creates change, which is our hashtag. Yours is delay is the way, one of your hashtags. What do you want them to know? I want parents to I want to embrace certain mindsets, right? So one that I'll I'll leave us with here is that most of the time when our children are in a digital space and something happens, most of the time, Lynn, that's not their fault. And I really truly want us to, to, to think about that, what that means. The one takeaway that I want parents to walk away from, we talk about a lot of practical, tactical routers, controls, all this kinds of stuff in our presentations. But if parents forget some of that, the one thing I want them to walk away with is a deep understanding for how difficult it is to grow up today. And that every single time they discover their child or a child in general who is making a poor digital choice, to approach that child with empathy and understanding, with the thought in your head, whatever they've done, it's probably not their fault. And I think we just have a better chance of encouraging them. Like what if, for every parent watching this, what if the next time you discover that your son or daughter is in trouble, has done something or something's happened to them online, what if at the end of that conversation with them, you actually had more trust and more care and more connection with your child at the end of that conversation. Those are some of the soft parts of being a digital parent that I think get often overlooked. It's not the software, it's not the routers, it's not the toggles. It's these kinds of conversations, these sort of look them in the eye moments and let them know that nothing they could do on that device would ever change the way we feel about them. So that when it happens to them, they come running to us instead of away from us. Because in isolation, one-on-one with technology, whether you're 4, 14, or 40, will all fall. So that's what I would say. It's a mindset. It sounds simple, but it's a really, really important shift. Not that simple, because I have a little lump in my throat after that, Chris. I, 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 I feel so passionate, like I could cry. Because we just have to share, you know, the humanity part. The, okay, you did something wrong. That's okay. We're going to fix it. There's a solution That's right. and let the kids come to us no matter what, because I've had a lot of parents tell me they delete things. They yell at the kids. I'm like, no, 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 no. You know, uh, again, there's parental autonomy, but we have to be very, uh, again, I, I, I steal from you all the time. Your excellent information. We have to put ourselves, you know, in their shoes, the kids That's right. yeah. and really think about all of this. I, of course, also think you should expand the company because everything you're saying 
I know you only have a certain amount of hours in the day, but the adults and kids are watching also everything the adults do, because I have a lot of parents say the kids aren't paying it. They don't, they don't know what I'm doing when I, you know, see what they're doing online, but that's a whole nother program, you know, for another day, the kids, the kids are smart and they're watching. And we have to be very protective of them. Well, Chris McKenna, the public, how do you want them to help you? What can they do besides sharing your information? Uh, can they volunteer with you? What would you like the public to do to help you directly? Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. We'd love to come and visit. Um, one of the things that we will be talking more about in, in the coming months is this advocacy, getting movement from parents and grandparents to help us communicate with their state and local legislators to move things. So look for more from what will soon be the Protect Young Eyes Foundation so that we can really make some waves in this space on the advocacy side. As I let others on my team run with the presentations, I hope to be focusing more to make some of those changes, Lynn. So more just be on a lookout for that. And when you see it, jump in. I'd love the help. Well, we at the Warriors will help you, Chris McKenna with anything possible. We love you. Your information is so good. It's so empowering. It's engaging and helping children and helping families across the United States. ProtectYoungEyes.com is the website. I'm urging all of you go there. Lots of great free information. We like to give out, you know, easy resources, as much free as we possibly can. Chris McKenna, you are certainly a dear colleague and I'm going to call you friend. And I'm also going to say our great digital warrior. Thank you for spending time with us today. We will, I'm sure, talk again soon. Thank you, Lynn.